participated in the earlier sessions also, we always made, uh, wait for like two or three minutes until everybody is in so that nobody will, uh, will miss the introduction then and uh, afterwards we start very soon. So just another two minutes. But I think a lot of people now in headquarters are also prepared to, to do that for a longer time because there's no, uh, no border that keeps them to uh, close to the company this, that they have to work and if they can do it from home and this will help, then I mean, why not? We are also doing that right now. So let's see how we have all oh, we have uh, a lot of different uh, destinations, nationalities today. We have Jakarta here, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok. Uh, Kieran is in Borneo, if that if is all right. Yeah, Borneo. Very nice. KL again. Manila, Philippines. So we are covering up the whole Southeast Asia region today. Oh, and Japan, of course. Nice. Okay, so for everybody who's already in, um, I'm talking about the rules and regulations today, as you know. So um, as we uh, always do, um, if you want to ask any questions during the session, uh, feel free to use the chat box. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, you. I, we hope that you understand that everybody has to be muted during the session. Otherwise, uh, it will be very noisy when 80 people asking questions simultaneously. And um, I will ask um, Peter some questions from time to time so that we listen a little bit to what he's saying. And uh, maybe he's also answering questions by himself. So then I, I don't have to uh, ask the question again. And um, yeah, in the end of the session, of course, we have also time to, uh, to ask uh, the question that have not been answered then. Peter, you said uh, you have also done uh, kind of this talk to Japan, is that right? Yes, I, I did it uh, <coughs> in Japan. <laughs> oh, really? In Japan? Okay, because we have a participant here from Japan, so maybe he's uh, one of the few that, uh, that have seen uh, what, you are, what you're telling us now. Yeah. But uh, if, if it was in Japan, then I guess uh, it was not this year, right? Uh, beginning, of, beginning of this year, I think, in February. Yes. So, so I'm I'm a little confused because I, in my second screen, I see the uh, the questionnaires or the the Umfragen. Yeah, the, the how, can call, I, how can I get rid of that? Um, I did. This will this will disappear uh, uh, from from itself when it's over. So it will only last for a certain time and then it will automatically disappear. So okay. we, yeah, you don't have to uh, worry about that. Okay, it's 8.5, um, we'll start now. Uh, hello to everybody. We have 83 participants as I can see now and I think it will also be a little bit more but we will start anyway. Uh, welcome. To all of you, good evening to the uh, Southeast Asia region and uh, good afternoon to Germany, uh, uh, to our guest speaker today. Uh, and yeah, uh, we haven't been seen in a, quite a couple of times. So uh, because Matthias has done uh, the, the last sessions, but I'm very fortunate to, to host this session today because um, it's a little bit different from what we have done in our Leica conversations earlier because we are um, most of the time talking to photographers and about their work and um, photography itself and today it will be a little bit different uh, because we are talking about lenses itself and uh, of course not the or not only the end result of the lenses uh, we actually uh, talk about the creation the design uh, the history and the development of of the lenses of leica and therefore, uh, we have a very special guest speaker today, 
Um, I think I don't have to introduce him much because as you participating so with such a huge amount here, I think a lot of you uh, know him. He's been working for Leica for so many years. Uh, he's been leading the optics development for so many years and yes, became one of the one of the faces of Leica. So um, of course, there's always a lot of people in the background in Leica which is doing the work, but there are some faces uh, like Dr. Kaufmann, for example, Stefan Daniel, or our speaker today, which are really known for, for Leica. So they are kind of representatives. And this has not only to do with the fact that um, he has been in the company for such a long time. It's only about that he really like to share his knowledge with everybody and it's not only about his knowledge and his experience it's also about the passion and his personal interest in in what he's doing so i would like to welcome peter kabel to our session nice to have you here peter yeah thank you very much lucas for your introduction hello everybody good evening <coughs> in south asia it's a great chance for me to talk about lenses again. I always like to talk about that. I have to apologize at the beginning that I, it will be a technical <coughs> presentation mostly. And I hope you can, can stay within the presentation till the end. I will talk about M lenses and uh, SL lenses. Lucas asked me to talk about my, my career, but, but in principle he said everything. I have been <coughs> with Leica since 1986. First, I started as optical designer for microscopy for six years, and then I moved to, to Leica camera. Before all of that, I, I had an, a study as a photo engineer, and before that, I had an apprenticeship as photographer. So there is a, a long <coughs> history in my career regarding photography. <coughs> And when I became, uh, when I was, had an apprenticeship as photographer, I was not very uh, satisfied with the results I produced. Today I know I didn't have always <laughs> the, the best lenses <laughs> to do my job as photographer. And that was one reason because uh, that my results were not uh, satisfying my, my expectations. So. And then so I, I went to, to create your own lenses. Pardon? You have to, you have decided to create your own lenses because you were not satisfied with the lenses that you have been using. Exactly. Yes, that's, oh. that's the point. So, but it's it's a long presentation. We have to see how we come through, and and let me start now. So the title is M lenses and SL lenses, and when we talk about Leica, Leica lenses, we have to talk about the history, and so. Before 1900, <coughs> photography was exhausting, time-consuming, and complicated. And very much know-how was required to, to fulfill, <coughs> uh, to do everything in photography, as you see here on the picture. And one thing was that a large ca ca format camera was used at that time. And due to the long <coughs> focal length of the large format cameras, you had to stop down very much. And stopping down very much means that you, the exposure time was very long, and so stiff photography was normally used. So perhaps somebody of you know uh, from the former times, uh, counting 21, 22, 23 for three minutes, uh, three, three seconds exposure time. And this makes a photo pho photography very stiff, as you know. And Oscar Barnack, the inventor of the, uh, of the, the 35 millimeter Leica camera, he had the idea to create a, a short uh, exposure time, the moment of NAMI called it, or the snapshot. <coughs> and uh, he had the idea to create a system uh, where you can, can, can use vivid uh, a tool for vivid photography. So and the reason for that is due to the smaller format, you do not need to stop down so much to get enough depth of focus. And so the exposure time is very short. And so then the, the snapshot photography was possible at that time. Banach was the inventor of the camera, but not only he was 
<coughs> involved in the development of the 35 millimeter camera. He also, there was also Max Berick, and the, the friendship of both is the reason why they worked together in creating the first lens for the 35 millimeter camera, because they did it by the way, not, this was not their main profession. Main profession of Berick was uh, microscopy and polarization microscopy and such things, and Berick had, had different tasks at lights at that time. But together they developed the 35 millimeter format and not only the camera but also the lens was needed. And the format, the 30, uh, 24 by 36 and the LMAX lens and the camera together was uh, the system. And it's quite interesting, quite interesting where they define the design targets for this system. So you can read in, brochure, in all the brochures how they found the design targets. So they took a printed postcard of a good photo, a printed postcard, and they counted the dots they need to get a good picture on this printed po postcard. And they come to the conclusion that they need one million dots for a postcard. And then they recalculated that they need optics and a system that <clears throat> where you can use uh, allowable circle of confusion or the minimum sharpness need to be smaller or equal 30 microns. And then you can recalculate uh, <clears throat> that you come to an area of 900 square millimeters and this 864 square millimeter is, is uh, <clears throat> the area of the 35 millimeter format camera. Peter, what, what reason why I the reason why I show this is this is still our, <coughs> our concept that we have to look at the result first. What do we think that the customer expect when he take pictures with the system we develop? And then we recalculate how good needs the system be to be. And, and this is the basis, still the basis today. And what is surprising is that pixel counting from this point of view is not new. Beric and Banach counted pixels. And the second is that the depth of focus table we use today is still based on the 30 micron circle of confusion allowable. From my per personal point of view, circle of confusion need to be much smaller today to define the depth of focus. <laughs> but this, nobody is willing or <coughs> is uh, motivated to, to change the depth of focus tables today. Peter, one question in between, sorry. Um, do you know where these one million dots come from? Is that also calculated in some way or how did they? No, no, they took a postcard. They, they, they took a printed postcard and they counted the dots of these postcards. Oh, they, they okay. Oh, okay, okay, now I said, I, I thought that this was just <laughs> like something they said and one million is, is okay. One million is okay, one million dots on a postcard delivers a sufficient or a good image mm -hmm. on the postcard. And this is very practical, yes? And, and I, 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 I'm, I'm so fascinated by this idea because we always need to be practical. Even though you think, oh, it's quite technical, MTF curve or whatever, but in principle, we always have a look at that, what the customer <laughs> what we want to deliver for the customer and the, the customer's expectation, I think, is a good picture or best picture. Yes? And so we always have to recalculate in this way, in this manner. Okay, so you know, 1913, 1914, the, the first, the, the prototype was done. <clears throat> in 1923 or 25, you, you can, there are different numbers. <laughs> the first Leica was <laughs> installed with an external range finder. And he, this is one of the first advertisements, yes. The first name of the camera was Lights Bana camera, and then Leica came out of that. <laughs> and it's uh, the, the ideal camera for, for amateurs, for reporters, for tourists, and for uh, <coughs> um, uh, scientists, let's say, yes. And the first, CSC. CSC is, is a name for um, 
compact system cameras and mirrorless cameras are named CSC today. And that's the reason why the first CSC in 35 millimeter was a Leica 1C. Yes. Mirrorless, easy to use, compact and with interchangeable lenses. And when I say this mirrorless and easy to use and compact, this is from the perspective at that time. Today, this camera wouldn't be easy to use because nobody knows how to use a manual uh, camera. <laughs> most of them, most of us are not able to do this. Yes. So in 1932, the Leica II came up with integrated rangefinder and screw mount. And this was a real uh, interchangeable lens uh, CSC camera. Yes. And this is an advertisement, uh, it's very funny, with automatic focusing. So autofocus at that time was, had, had a different meaning than we think today, autofocus. Yes. So in Leica 3F was to 1950, yes. And before I continue, I would like to introduce a perceived performance. And how do I judge perceived, per perceived performance? Is a performance a customer exp uh, uh, think the system delivers and I divided in it into five uh, characters the first is light flux and this is not easy to understand but I need to explain light flux definition so everybody knows F number and F number this de describes the amount of light from object point which will be transported to the image point but light flux is the whole light the lens system transports through the system, through itself through the lenses to the image. And this is a whole light, the lens collects. That's the light flux. Very important figure for optical designers. How much effort do I have to put into the light, uh, into the system regarding light flux? Yes. So compactness is always. So, sorry, Peter, first, can I ask a question for the, for the light flux? Um, is the, you said it's an impo important figure for optical designers. Um, is there a reason why it's not an important figure for customers? So is is there um, no need for customers or for uh, in good, good question it on the lens? So the reason why I, I, I introduce light flux is when we compare different uh, sensor format systems, light flux is very important even though for the customer. Mm -hmm. For the customer, it's better to talk about equivalent F number. This implements the same light, light, light flux. So for example, when you have an APS system in, in comparison to a full frame system, the crop factor is 1.5. And the light flux <coughs> uh, changes with the sensor area as the, the equation shows here, the sensor area here, yes. And smaller than, and crop factor 1.5 means that the sensor area is two times smaller of APS regarding the full format. So the light flux is half, <coughs> half light flux with the same F number. And this means equivalent F number for APS is uh, when you compare F2, full, full format is F2.8 or F3 for APS system. So it's also important for, for, for the customer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So overall length is, is the first service of the lens to the, to the image. This gives you an impression how big the lens is, how long. But if you compare different sensor formats, you have to, to look at the oil. It's better to look at the rel uh, relative overall length or relative size. And this is the overall length divided by semi-diameter, <coughs> uh, by the uh, semi-diameter, yes. So. Image performance, of course, we define image performance by MTF <laughs> values. As higher the MTF is better. I, I, I will explain MTF a little bit more. Best F number, how much do I need to stop down to get best MTF? And ghost and flare reduction is a is an, imp uh, an indicator for good performance. Ease of use, Oops. sorry, ah, so MTF, is, is there a need to talk about MTF a little bit more in detail? Yeah, maybe a little bit, what that would yes. be. Okay, 
MTF means modulation transfer function <coughs> and describes the resolution in terms of frequency and the contrast, the modulation of the image. And so here you see uh, some free, uh, if the, the total width of this is one millimeter on sensor or negative or whatever, and you see one line pair is one black line between white line. And if you have five line pairs, you have two, uh, you have five black lines and five white lines and so on. Yes. And if you have, if, if you look, for example, for, for the 10 line pairs per millimeter, the 100% contrast is black is black and white is white and between that is uh, everything. And if uh, you have 40% contrast, here in this case, the white is not really white and the black is not really black, it's gray, and then you have 40%. The equation for that is, is in, in this uh, direction, black minus dark, uh, bright minus dark, and divided by bright minus black. So, so in reality, I need to, to highlight, in reality, <coughs> most objects are not black and white in total. The objects itself are with low contrast. And as better the lens perform, as better low contrast objects can be transferred to the image. And this is very important. If you only look at such bars as I show here, there is not a big difference for, for lenses which perform 100% or 80%. And the rest you can do by, by image in enhancement or so. But if you have low contrast in object, and with the low contrast transform, transformation by the lens, there will be nothing at the end. And there, the best lenses excels their performance. That's very important to know, yes. <laughs> so, so it's still crisp and sharp and, and whatever you think, yes. So, and here, when we talk about frequency, when we divide this image here of this house, old house in Wetzlar, this, these are the low frequencies and medium frequencies and high cre higher frequencies, just as an example. As more you go in detail of the, of the image, as more you look in the higher frequencies. Yes. So, and when we have here the MTF curves for 40 line pairs, 20 line pairs and so on, and this is image height zero and this is image height 21, this means image height zero is the middle of the image and goes up to 21 to the edge. This is only one direction. Due to the fact that optics is rotational symmetric in theory and at Leica in practice too. If the rotational symmetric, we can, we can have a look at all these areas. Yes. And here you see image height 12 covers half of the area. So this is this area here, image height here. And 15 is this part here. And 21 here is the edge. So and here is a good lens. This is the object and this is the image of the object. You don't see really a difference. Even Yes, I, I can see. But if you have a bad lens, <coughs> or worse, a, a, a lower performance lens, let's so. So here the higher frequencies are nearly not to, you can't see it here. It's an example. So in here, here is a good lens and there's a bad lens. And now it switches between good lens and bad lens and here is an, uh, a loop. And there you can see how the differences are. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you go one line, 100 line pairs, what is it? If you take this dog and the hairs of the dog are ex equivalent to 100 line pairs, when you take a picture with a 50 millimeter lens in the distance of one meter, these hairs are 100 line pairs. And the nose here or the character of the nose is, is nearly one, four millimeter in object and this corresponds to five line pairs. Just to give you a feeling about what does it mean 100 line pairs or 40 line pairs or whatever. Good, okay. Let's go to ease of use. Ease of use means convenience for the user. How good does the camera assist the, the, the user? How many automatic functions do we have? And how, or how much knowledge is needed to 
by using the system. And the, four, the, the fifth is ro ro robustness. And we have our own robustness definition is durability, yes? Humidity and moisture resistance, shock proof, and permanent low stability, splash protected, and scratch proof. And these are the, the values we, we guarantee, let's say guarantee, I don't know, Werte versprechen in German, I don't know, say, say, the value proposition. So the value proposition, one, one very important thing is, especially for M lenses, <laughs> We want to deliver lenses that are stable for a long, long time. Yeah. Okay. So, and when we give numbers for each of these characters <coughs> and put it into a graph, you see here two lenses. Lens number one is, is poor, and lens number one, uh, two is, is very on a high level because every so lens number one doesn't exist because even a single lens element does more than this. But the lens number two seems to be a flying submarine tank, yes. And everybody wants to have a flying submarine tank, but in principle, it never exists. <laughs> yeah. But you get so, always asked for it, right? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we try to, to come close, yes, always, but uh, it's, it's not easy. So let's have a look at the first Leica uh, lens uh, system here. Yes. And <clears throat> just a short, short introduction. When you look at the, here, here is, is the same, the lens is 28 millimeter 5.6 and 90 millimeter 4 and 2. All these lenses have a, a very typical footprint. And the footprint is always three groups. And there's a, the reason for that is that always all these lenses have only three groups. The reason for that is at that time the lenses, the lens elements had no anti-refraction coating. And so there was only there were only six air glass surfaces allowed. If you if you use more lens elements to improve the performance of the lens, improvement in terms of aberration were possible, but <coughs> but uh, on the same side, the, the, the reflections due to the many surfaces, glass air surfaces, increased, so there was no improvement possible. Yes. And when we have a, a risk retrospective now, now we look from today, what did the lenses uh, deliver? So light flux was six, because F number was 3.5 or so, or 2.8. The robustness is there, of course, because today you can use, still use such lenses. The size was quite good, was very small. The image performance was not that high. The reason why I say this is you, could read, you can read in the old brochure, please stop down two or three steps to get the best performance. So while open, the best performance was not there. And that's the reason why I say, okay, retrospective, it's not the best performance we have. In the ease of use from today's perspective, of course, it was not easy to use the system because everything you had an, an external exposure meter, you have to, uh, to put everything by hand to do by hand, yes. So let's have a look at this graph here. This here is perceived performance and here is the lens volume. If you want to improve the performance of a lens, you can add some lens elements. And there, and uh, as more lens elements you use, as bigger the lens need to be, but as better the performance will be. But there are some, some limitations. And this, this gray area is state of arm. But here's a limitation here. You couldn't improve the performance. We can't improve the performance without, uh, and come over to this area here. And, and there's a second limitation at that time was the second limitation, the number of lens elements. And what we are talking about for the next uh, slides or for the, for the whole presentation is we talk about innovation. To, to get better performance, to get perceived performance, you need innovation <coughs> to go in that direction and not in that direction. Enlarging the system, enlarging the system, that is easy. 
you can do, but for the customer, it's not easy to, <laughs> to use big lenses. Yeah? And that's the reason why we talk, we need, we need to go in that direction. And innovation, this is the, the hint, because I think 1954, it was a year of innovation at Leica. The one thing was introduction of the M camera, yes, and the M bayonet. And with introduction of the M camera, we talk about the, the rangefinder system we implemented. You know it already, I think. But the technical innovation we had internally was on the one side, we, we at Lights, we had the, the new uh, installed or developed uh, glass materials developed at Lights, very nice glasses. Here is a, a diagram. Here you see refractive index and here you see the low dispersion indicator, the other number. And all these glasses here, lights developed to improve performance of the lens system. High refractive glasses and low dispersion glasses here. Today, everybody can use these glasses, but at that time, the uh, lights <laughs> recognized the missing of, of typical optical glasses needed to get a better performance, yes. And so lights introduced uh, the lights uh, glass laboratory. And the second innovation at lights was the coating technology. <clears throat> to be honest, not lights invented the coating technology. This was done by Mr. Smakula at Zeiss during, uh, in, in the 30s, 1930s. He, he filed a patent at Zeiss and after World War II, everybody was <coughs> allowed to use uh, these coatings. And, but coating on the one side is, is not, it was not easy to handle. And that's the reason why, why Leica in introduced coating first in 1954. So, and here is, this is one, uh, <coughs> the, the an image of the, our lights objective uh, brochure internal uh, paper for for the for the uh, <coughs> manufacturer for for the lights employees from 1954 where you can see a coating machine yes. and these both technologies we implemented into the lenses and one big uh, one very famous example is uh, the Noctilux one by one 50 millimeter designed by uh, Walter Mantler. He implemented glass technology, high refractive glass in, uh, glasses, and as you see, 12, 12 uh, air glass uh, surfaces, and for this you need uh, coatings. Yes. And so the second generation M-mount lenses, I call it second generation, <coughs> was much better, faster lenses, we have better performance and so on. And when we look at the perceived performance for the second generation, how could we realize that? You see glass technology enabled us to, to, <coughs> to improve the performance without, without uh, increasing the size or reduce the size by keeping the performance. And the second was the coating, so we could build lenses with, with uh, more lens elements, but they needed to be bigger, yes. So, and when we have a look at the perceived performance, retrospective again, the light flux, of course, was there with F number one, yeah. And the compactness was still there, yes, we kept the, the compactness. The image performance, seven. Why seven? Because when you look in the brochure, in the older brochure, you can read, please stop down one or two steps to get best performance. So wide open, the performance was not there. Available light photography was able because the, the, the fast lenses were there, but to get best performance, you need to stop down. So let's, and, but with the M system, the traditional CSC camera was born. It sounds a little crazy, a traditional system was born from today's perspective. This was a, <coughs> a hallmark of, of the CSC camera uh, systems. Yes. And the, there are, are some advantages of the M system. It's compact, discrete, fast lenses were available, high performance could be delivered. 
right viewfinder and very robust but there are also some limitations for the analog m system and no zoom system focal length range was limited the close focus distance 0.7 and no ease of use even today <laughs> so. and there was a first challenge i talk about the second challenge later for the m system in the 70s there was a strong competition between SLR camera and rangefinder camera. And the advantage of the SLR camera was what you see is what you get. And the wider range of focal lens, lenses were possible, zoom lenses were possible, close focus and macro was possible. <coughs> and the advantage of the M system, you see more than you get. For example, the, the wide rangefinder, 28 millimeter, you always see. <clears throat> the frame and if you use a 35 you can see what is coming in what is going out when do I have to push the button <clears throat> and and all these things yes it's, it's always a good uh, feature to see more than you get but you learn need to learn uh, to use it the brightness of the viewfinder doesn't uh, depend on the on the f number of the lens the focus accuracy at that time was much better for wide angle lenses <coughs> at that time and high performance in compact size was there. But unfortunately, the Wetzlar <coughs> management in Wetzlar in Germany planned to stop the M camera. Fortunately, I need to say our colleagues in Canada at that time, we had a factory in Canada, they decided <coughs> uh, to, to take over the, the production of the, of the M camera. And this is funny here, the three Walters, the Walter Kluck, Walter Mantler, the optical designer, and Walter Bauer, they, these three decided at, at Lights Canada to, to take over the production. And due to this fact, we, can, uh, we have this, the M system still today. 1984, the M6 came back to, to Wetzlar. And Innovation improvement of the performance without enlarging the, <coughs> the, the, the optical system required new, new techniques. And we started in 1960 with A-sphere technology to implement A-spheres in, in, uh, into the lens system. To get best performance without increasing the size is always the same story. And we try to implement A-sphere technology, I name it one, the first version with the Noctilux 1 by 1.2, 50 millimeter. And the production and verification was very, very complicated. And in principle, it was a disaster for econ in economy <coughs> at lights. <laughs> we, 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 we paid more, uh, we, we spent more money to, to produce than we got in the market. Can you maybe tell a little bit about what is so difficult or actually start with what is an a spherical lens and why it is uh, more difficult to produce that compared to a spherical mm -hmm. lens? So a spherical lens is, is based on a sphere and for a sphere to uh, the, the surface is, is, is a sphere. Yes. Yeah. It's a part of a sphere and the production is, is based on a sphere. You can, you can follow the sphere in the production. To, to make an A sphere is a deviation of, of the sphere. And this is not so easy. You can't use the same production technology like you, you do it uh, with, a, with a sphere. And the, the one thing is measuring a, a sphere is not that easy. And polishing the sphere is not that easy. In principle, as long you are not able to measure in exact ways of the A sphere, you can't optimize your processes and that was very complicated so <laughs> we didn't stop our lights didn't stop to to try to implement a spheres and we we had the second uh, trial with a very famous 35 millimeter aspherical so zoom looks <clears throat> but again in principle it was an economic disaster it was a very, very good optical design and setup and very innovative with this outer shape here of this lens system and very good performance wide open and stopping down. Very good performance. 
but again, it was a disaster. With A-Sphere Technology 3, press technology, we could first time <coughs> uh, introduce a lens, and this is uh, the daughter of the 35 A-Spherical, I would say. <coughs> this was the first lens system with a press technology we took over, or we, we could use uh, <coughs> vendors from, from Japan. They deliver the press uh, A-Spheres, and so we could implement this technology to get best performance. <coughs> and we still use pressed A-spheres as much as we can <coughs> in, in our aspherical lens systems. But we didn't stop because press A-sphere <coughs> has some limitations in size, in glass materials and, and all these things. And so we, we implemented a force technology and we still use it here at lights. <coughs> And this is a polishing A-sphere. And the first one, one of the very famous, uh, famous lens with the first A-sphere technology for what is a Aposomic 150. And here we get really high performance, wide open, <coughs> and stopping down, of course, yes, also. And when you look at the, the A-sphere technology 4, we use today lots of machines and, and measuring equipment is needed. We didn't develop these machines, but we, we developed the setup, how to come to the best performance with this A-sphere. Yeah. And this was a tough job, to be honest, yes. If you compare it with spherical, with sphere production, you only need these two machines here. It's much more complicated. And what we are doing in A-sphere technology is more than, than MTF, requires because due to the production processes you you will find some errors on the surface this is a measurement of the surface in principle it's a good surface but you have some irregularities rotational symmetric on the surface here and this leads to to so-called we call it onion rings in the bouquet bouquet is not controlled by mtf bouquet is is what you, what you see in the unsharp area with spotlight. And to get rid of this bouquet, we implemented a technology <coughs> developed in, 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 uh, in Rochester, in the US. But we were the first who implemented this for, this for this application. And here is a fine polishing machine, a QED machine by, by polishing punctual this, this surface to reduce these onion rings here down to a nearly unseen uh, error, yes, down to zero. And this is very important. Why do I tell this story? The story is that today you think A-sphere technology, yes, everybody can use it, and, but <coughs> it was a long way to go there and lights invested a lot to, the, to do that. And we have big, uh, uh, we have a knowledge in-house in how to use this A-sphere. Because when you look at an, a good, a perfect lens element is useless if the housing and the assembly within the system is not perfect. And housing means you have a lens barrel where you <coughs> fix it and with screwing or whatever, we have different techniques. If, if this is not done well, you have decentrations within the optics. I told you about MTF that we are talking about rotational symmetric systems. In theory, rotational symmetric, but you have to keep this rotational symmetry, symmetry within the production. And this is very important. On paper, you can do everything, but you need to, to transfer it from paper to the, to the reality. And this is what we are doing in a very good, high precision, I think. <laughs> so so, it, so it was possible for you to, to create a flying submarine tank on paper, but then we were not able to produce that in a... In a exactly, uh, that's, that's the point, yes. In principle, we, can, we can, can produce thickness down to zero of the lens system in the middle, mm -hmm. but, but you can produce it, yes. <laughs> yeah. But let's, let's continue. 
So, for example, the, the lens is mounted here within this cell here, and you see the optical axis is, doesn't fit with the, with the barrel axis, axis of the barrel. And then centering error appears. And what are we doing? We, are, we, we, we tilt the mechanical <coughs> axis so that the optical axis is our reference. And then we do machining of the barrel to get high precision. Yes. And so we, we, get <coughs> we get the alignment here. Yes. So we, we, we do <coughs> milling and uh, <coughs> turning to get high precision for this uh, mounting. And this is a, an image of this uh, part of this machine. I, I'm not allowed to show everything. <laughs> and we can, we can guarantee tolerances between two microns and five microns. In principle, we could go lower, but this is our, our regular uh, limitation we count with. Yes. And <clears throat> when we talk ace, about A spheres and we talk about mechanics and optics and the combination of all of this, we need to have a look at the Noctilux 0.95 uh, we developed, uh, we introduced in 2009. And here you see again, we, we implemented everything I talked about till now. Glass material, A sphere uh, technology, mechanical precision, and we implemented floating element to get high performance wide open in a compact way. I also talked about uh, the Noctilux uh, designed by Mandla and made in Canada here. This is this one and this is 0.95. And here you see the mechanics <coughs> is more complex than here, even though here is a complex mechanics, but it's, it's one lens head that moves in that direction by using this uh, the focusing mount and here is here are some 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 inter uh, uh, internal mountings and the on the one side the lens head is moving on the other side the the uh, the floating element is moving and on the third here's a uh, the range finder couple uh, a curve here for moving moving the range finder uh, curve on the on the camera is is also implemented. So three movings at the same time. And here is again focusing ring here, focusing mount, outer focusing mount, inner focusing mount. Yes, the rangefinder movement here, floating element. Everything needs to be moved. It's it's a very heavy system. It's not not uh, light. Yes, due to the amount of glass we implemented. <laughs> But some fine mechanics and the precision of the mechanic is very complicated to, to produce. And this is one of our competencies in the production. Not only mechanics, but also optics. And this is what I want to try to express. Using A spheres requires special technique in the production. Mechanics needs special technology to implement to get precise lenses at the end, coating machines, of course all these things and much more we do to produce such a beautiful lens like the, the Noctilux. So the third generation of lens, M lenses are <coughs> described by A-sphere technology. As I said here, we use technology three and four today. This is molded A-spheres and grinded and polishing. And here you see Noctilux always was a technology driver of our uh, yes, for our production. A spheres, then glass technology, and today we use everything what we can, can use to get best performance in a compact size. And why are we doing this? Why? The reason for that is to get best performance wide open. To give you the possibility to make pictures never seen before. These are not available light lenses where you need to stop down to get best performance. Of course, you can use these lenses for available light, but it's not only for available light. You always can use it wide open if you want to have the shallow depth of focus. And then you can take pictures as I sh uh, show here. So and this is the third generation from 1989 with A spheres. 
at that time, there was not the Noctilux 0.95 was ready at that time. That's the reason why I say this was not A-sphere. And today, this is a 135, the upper utility is also not A-sphere. But the rest was with, uh, equipped with A-spheres. So let's have a look at the <coughs> perceived performance at the, this graph. What did we do? We pushed the limits, yes. So we increased the performance without increasing the size. Yes. And we increase the size a little bit to implement floating elements, to be honest. Yes. Floating elements need a little bit more space within the mechanics, and that's the reason why I think we had to <laughs> increase the size. And when we have a look at the retrospective again, but from today's perspective, if you do this <coughs> perceived performance equation here, light flux is 10, compactness is 8, we, because of of the floating elements, we got a little, uh, the lenses became a little bit bigger. Image performance is nine, and this is, this is really, really important. I always want to send the message, never stop down if you do not need the depth of focus. There is no need to stop down to get best performance because the performance is there wide open. And not only in theory, but also in practice. That's the reason why I told you the, the things about the production we are doing to get best performance for each lens we deliver. Ease of use is seven because no autofocus, of course. You, you need to allow the camera to teach you to make best pictures, yes. <laughs> the M camera is not an automatic uh, <coughs> monster, let's say. <laughs> yes. Yes, you, you need to be willing <coughs> to, to, to learn. I described this like a like a fountain pen. Yes, when you start to write to write with a fountain pen, your your writing doesn't look good. But as long as you use a fountain pen, as better as your writing will be. It's like M camera using. <laughs> At the beginning, you will fail, <laughs> but you will be learn. And 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 with these lenses, you you can perform on a quite high level. So. The M system as a classical system, <coughs> limitations of the M system you know already. But how are the expectations today? Today the wish list and requirements are digital, compatible, zoom lenses should be applied, 35 millimeter format, close focus, autofocus, and all these things. And now we come to the second challenge I, I talked about, I, I mentioned before. So at the time, yes. Many people say Leica nearly missed the train regarding digi digitalization. The story is a little different because we always believed in the M system. And when digital cameras came up or digital systems came up, we tried to, to implement a digital <coughs> system. But at that time, at the beginning of the digitalization, the sensors needed uh, telecentric lenses, we were told. You need telecentric lenses. What does it mean? That the incident angle of all rays is rectangular to the sensor here. And, and the M system is the total opposite of telecentric because of the short focal, the flange back here of the bayonet. The, the lenses can be, can, or the rear part of the lens can come close to the sensor or to the image, uh, to the film. And due to this fact, the incident angle for the edge is quite steep. And at the beginning of digitalization, <laughs> pictures would have looked like this here. Yes, in the middle is okay, but on the, red, uh, on the edge, it's quite dark. And we, we had to overcome this problem. By, and we wanted to keep the M system alive by, with digitalization. And so we implemented a micro lens offset in cooperation with Kodak, I need to, to say. Kodak helped us a lot to implement such a micro lens offset. That means in front of each pixel, there was a micro lens offset so that you, the light can come into the sensor and here is a pixel and this is a, a light sensitive area of the pixel so the, the, the light need to come here and we could realize it. And I say we <coughs> conquered the crisis 
we defined how, how new CSC systems has to have to look like. We, and, and we were the pioneers of the CSC sensor at that time. It's a small company in comparison to others. Yes. And we pushed the limits of this technology. So in the third generation <coughs> today, with A spheres and floating elements, you see here, and this is <coughs> what I try to explain, wide open, compact, highest performance in all these things. The second example here is a 21 millimeter F1.4, high performance, not only at infinity, but also at close focus here. This is close, fo close focus MTF. And we could realize that because of the floating element we implement, just as an example. And here again, <laughs> ultra high precision turning and milling machine here, as I mentioned, we used several times here in this case. And here are the tolerances you see, five micron is the tolerance for the distance from here to this uh, <coughs> point. So that's a, that's a first lens element can be exchanged very easy with a very tight tolerance. Yes. Again, floating elements and much of uh, mechanics here, three different coupled movements, lens, floating element, and rangefinder curve. It's the same like the Noctilux, I think. And here, we wanted to design a very compact lens with the 21.1.4, but we also wanted to have a, a very effective and compact lens hood. And so we implemented this point cut lens hood thread. Yes. And otherwise, we wouldn't be able to create such an, a lens hood, which is effective regarding uh, protection for ghost and flare. And at the same time, we want to use the rangefinder uh, functionality of the camera. And so we were, we were forced to go in that direction to find a way to keep it compact in, in, in total. Yes? And that's the reason why we implemented uh, point cut lens hoods within the <coughs> uh, system. So <coughs> one of the latest uh, uh, introduction was uh, Noctilux 75. Again, here we implemented everything <laughs> of technology. Yes. Maximum effort in opto mechanics <coughs> and smallest depth of focus, highest optical performance, and the A spheres. Yes. I, I think you know this. And here the performance is quite high, really, and not only at infinity, but also at close focus. And that's, there's no need to stop down. Of course, the improvement of the performance is there here, from 60% to 80% for 40 line pairs. But <coughs> there's no need to stop down to get best performance in that case, if you want to have to the, uh, uh, the depth of focus, the shallow depth of focus. There is no need to stop down because 60% contrast is for 40 line pairs is quite high. In here, here is, uh, one, one question in between. We have a question here from, from Jerry, um, who was saying in the beginning that uh, he really likes um, the compact lenses like the 50 APO or the 57 APO or the 28 uh, Sumaron. And uh, then he's asking what, what uh, uh, next high-end compact lenses will be released. So I think, of course, we, we cannot talk about that. Um, but then he's also saying, like, he's expecting pancake lenses from Leica. So maybe you can give a, a hint or something that, that is this something that is in the, on, the, on the schedule in Leica? I, I can't give... <laughs> Sorry, I can't give a hint to that. Okay. I'm not allowed to do so. so. Okay. But please, please... Give give Lucas a hint what we should do, and he can talk with Stefan Daniel, and then I will be ordered to do so. So, <laughs> so that's a very good platform for all of you that you can uh, tell us your wish list here, and then you ha you have the the direct contact today. Okay, thank you, Vida. Go on, please. Okay. So shallow depth of focus. This is a depth of focus table we deliver always with in our. Uh, information 
And this, this depth of focus uh, table is based on the 30 microns uh, circle of confusion. Internally at Leica, we do a, our own depth of focus calculation. This is based on the pixel size. Yes. So we say two pixel is a depth, of, uh, is a basis for the depth of focus table. And you see here the shallow depth of focus is smaller than that what the table says. These are some pictures and how you can use the depth of focus, the shallow depth of focus. This is one of, her, of the very first pictures we took with the 75, and this is a mechanical designer of the system. I'm sorry, Peter, another question in, in between again. So I think this picture also shows that there's a, like an end in depth of focus, because I mean, it wouldn't make sense to have a, a smaller, smaller and smaller depth of focus at some point, because then anyway, nothing will be in focus at some point. So depth of field, <laughs> Must be must be there some way. So yes, uh, no need to to increase that further. <laughs> it's always a challenge uh, uh, to to use uh, the shallow depth depth of focus in an appropriate way. This is a big challenge for everybody. Yeah. And I I agree with you. How far should we go with uh, with the F number? <clears throat> I think 0.95 is more than enough. And we do not talk about available light lenses anymore because of the sensitivity of the sensor, the high sensitivity of the sensor we have today. There is no need for available light uh, lenses in, in that uh, context, I think. The, the F number is, is to control the depth of focus and to control your expression what you want to express it within this image and this is one of the pictures i like very much because you can go closer and you see more yes and it's so crisp and so three-dimensional even though it's a two-dimensional image it seems to be three-dimensional when you and, and that's that's fascinating for me yes <laughs> and for this you need good lenses yes you get go closer and you see more this is a 75. There's nothing. I did nothing with the, with the, with the files. This is a JPEG I got out of the, of, out of the, the camera. <clears throat> yes. And so this is a Noctilux 50 and the 75 and the 90, the 75 Noctilux and the 90 Sumilux are, let's say, <coughs> very, close to the, to the Noctilux. And the reason why we, we do F1.2 and F1.25 F1 and F1.5 is if you use the equation, the, the, the entrance pupil diameter of, the, of this lens here is 60 millimeter, yes? a little bit less than 60 millimeter. If you divide 75 by 1.25, it's 60 millimeter entrance pupil diameter. And 90 divided by 1.5 is 60 diam millimeter diameter. Because we couldn't go further with the, the entrance pupil diameter, and that's the reason why we have these F numbers here. And this is a platform system. This means we develop this in, in parallel, <coughs> and the front group is the same. Yes. The focusing mount is nearly the same. It's the, the construction or the design and mechanical design is the same, but there are some differences. <coughs> and the, the outer shell is, is nearly the same. It's the same. The only difference is the engraving. Yes. <coughs> Several housing parts are the same. Yes. <coughs> and again, light flux. When we talk of 0.95, 100% live flux is wide open. When you stop down to 1.4, you only have 50% light flux. If you, if you stop down to F number 5.6, only 3% of the light flux you use. And, and I, I'm kidding a little bit, but I would like to have the functionality in the camera. If you stop down, the camera should ask, are you sure? When, when you have such a lens, you always, do I really need to stop down? 
or is it only because of the exposure time or whatever else? But never stop down if you do not need the depth of focus. And it's like a Windows functionality, yes. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you really sure to stop down? Perhaps we should implement this in the camera. <laughs> Uh, so Peter, here we have another question here from uh, Peter Tan. I would like to uh, ask you to in between. Um, he's asking uh, regarding the focus uh, accuracy of the of the Nucilux. So if you focus with a rangefinder compared to a EVF, uh, what do you think which is more accurate, or how would you judge that? Uh, <clears throat> it's a critical situation. Um, in principle, when you when you use a rangefinder, you focus. Then you do your your image composition, and then you push the button. And in between, between focus uh, image composition and pushing the button, you move the camera and you move in that direction. And this is very critical regarding focusing accuracy. It's not the accuracy of the, of the rangefinder system, but the, yourself, when you, when you do not use a tripod, and the M is not a tripod camera, yes? When you do not use a tripod, you need to be sure, that, uh, you need to know that your movement in that, that direction, in, in that direction, yes, is more critical. Because first you do focusing, then you do image composition, and then you push the button. And when you use live view, you can do, you can do focus composition and focusing at the same time, and that is sometimes better. Yes, but but the rangefinder is is on a on a critical level in that case regarding accuracy. This is not a laser rangefinder; it's and uh, uh, has some limits. <coughs> on the other side. Perhaps you need to shoot more. Um, you you not need to to use a burst rate, a burst mode. Some uh, one or two pictures more uh, to get the right uh, focus position. Yes. Okay. May I continue? Yeah, sure. So today we have very high <coughs> performance. Compact system, light flux, and robustness is there. The ease of use is due to the missing. The automatic function is is, uh, is still still not on the highest level. But but uh, <coughs> on the other side, we have compactness and image performance on the and light flux on a very high level. And this is a compromise you have to take it into account when you use M camera. And now I come to the, the, the out of there's no autofocus. The M camera will never be an autofocus camera, then it's not an M camera. And so, <laughs> close focus you can use today when you use EVF and when you use uh, the macro adapter or when you use the L Pro, you can use close focus and you can use zoom lenses by, by adapters. We don't have zoom lenses so many in, in the program. So in principle, everything is fulfilled. We can accomplish, but autofocus and ease of use is not there. And this is a point where I would like to switch over to to SL system. Can you be continue? Um, Look at. I, it, it depends on uh, what do you think how long the uh, the SL, SL system would be. Because I mean, we have anyway. We have some questions here, and uh, we have almost. So, like so, one, so no. I need oh, a half an hour, I think. Okay, yeah, let's just go on. I mean, that's why we are here, so. Let's, so. First we talked about the mirrorless cam, we talked about the M camera, now we talk about the SL system. <laughs> and it's a modern professional camera, of course, highest performance, pushing the limits, <laughs> ease of use, because we have all functionality we know we, we need. Triple A image stabilization, bright electronic viewfinder, and all these things we have. And before I step into the SL system, I need to have a look at the APS system in between. When we started to to design the X, the APS camera, 
And that's the reason why I talked about Banach and Berek. We de defined the design targets for the first APS camera. So we said printed pictures should have the same quality like 35 millimeter format. And so we said crop factor is 1.5, so the performance need to be better 1.5 times in comparison to M. And so we took into a, we take into account 60 line pairs instead of 40 line pairs, but internally only. And so we performed 60 line pairs with 50% contrast. We did so, and I think this was very successful. And when we started to design the SL system, we took over these targets. We took over the, the, the targets from the APS system. We say we want to be better 1.5 times than the classical M lenses. And in, internally, we say we take 60 line pairs with 50% contrast. I will come back to that later. And this should this 60 line pairs should perform with 50% contrast. I will explain later why. One of the first lenses we introduced was 1.4, 50 millimeter. <coughs> Exceptional overall performance. We have a close focus with one by 10 uh, uh, magnification and we implemented stepper motor and the relative size is from here to there is 3.2. Here you see the performance in terms of MTF, 40 line pairs is this. When you say this drop here is due to the distortion of the color, color distortion, and this we compensate by software, but we didn't uh, publish uh, MTF curves, including software enhancement. Distortion is will be compensated by software, uh, color distortion and wig netting. These are the three points we, we we compensate by software. But what I want to, to highlight today is, is are the SL primes here. The three, the, the seven lenses. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. The seven lenses with F2. And I would like to talk about the image performance, the autofocus, the value written, retention, and the compactness. And the performance ready for the future, we think autofocus, precise, fast, and quiet, and robust and highly durable. As I told you about the M lenses, we try to, to implement this uh, performance also into the these lenses and F2 to get compact lenses. Let's first talk about autofocus. So we have contrast autofocus implemented and contrast autofocus is we go through the focus maximum maximum sharpness here and then with one step we want to go back to the right position this is uh, the principle of contrast fo autofocus and for this we need <coughs> we need a precise and quiet uh, motor and we decided to implement stepper motors <coughs> The restriction with stepper motor is that the focusing lens need to be lighter than 20, 20 grams to perform well. And here is a stepper motor implemented. And when you see here, sorry, go back. And to realize stepper motor, we, we decided to design completely new lens systems with two focusing elements independently moving and controlled by two motors <coughs> synchronized drives also. And uh, this was a totally new optical approach. So the precision is, is defined by, by, by these figures here. This is the stepper motor here is uh, the linear gear <laughs> uh, this, and the rotation here means is divided in 640 steps and one rotation is equivalent to a movement of the focusing lens with uh, 0.5 uh, millimeter. And so we have <coughs> an accuracy 
when you divide 0.5 by 640, we have an accuracy of 0.8 microns movement we can control. Yes. And so this was a new optical design approach. But to implement this, this focusing group within the system, we had to, to change our, our guiding system. So we have to implement linear guides. And linear guides are totally different to that what we use normally. And this was a quite high uh, <coughs> challenge for us to, to realize that. And I want to highlight here, electronic is a technology driver within this uh, system. Yes. Let's come to the high image performance. <coughs> Megapixel rays, can our lenses keep up? So we recognize that the megapixel rays don't stop. Yes, 24 mega megapixel with the uh, with the SL 80, uh, 87 we have with the with the SL2 and 60 megapixel and 100 megapixel. What is there? And as as larger the <coughs> the megapixel amount, as as small as the pixel size will be, and as small as the pixel size is as high as a frequency for the Nyquist frequency. And what does it mean? So <coughs> when we look at the MTF, this is a little different to that what we know <coughs> uh, till now. This is the frequency here, normalized, and here's the contrast. And here are the, the lower frequencies, and here's the higher frequencies, and here's the resolution limit of the system, of the lens, and this is defined by the F number. Yes. And when we, we don't have diffraction limited optics, we don't have that, but this is a typical curve of the lens. And here is sharpness is defined with 50% contrast. If a lens has 50% contrast or more contrast for this frequency, it's recognized as a sharp, as sharp. If we have 10% contrast or lower, this is barely recognizable. And, and so we, we did some we did some definition. <coughs> the sensor, the Nyquist frequency of the sensor should be equivalent with a 10% MTF or smaller. And so we defined on the other hand, 50% contrast should have the, the lens with the half Nyquist frequency. So when we have Nyquist frequency of the 40 megapixel sensor, we have 40 line pairs. And if we go to 60 megapixel, we should have 60 line pairs. I know that 132 divided by 2 is not 60, but it's a rough estimation. It gives you a rough estimation. The message is, if the balance between lens and, and, and sensor should be equal, then half Nyquist frequency should have 50% contrast. If the lens has lower contrast for the half Nyquist frequency, the lens is limited, it's a limitation. If the, if the performance of the lens is higher than 50% contrast for the half Nyquist frequency, the sensor is a limit. So, and if, if the, the, the balance is there, if sensor <coughs> performance and lens performance is on the, on the same level. It's not easy to understand, I know, but best balance between lens performance and resolution is half Nyquist frequency should have 50% contrast. So 24 megapixel, 40 line pairs should have 50% <coughs> contrast, 60 line pairs corresponds to 60 megapixel. So let's have a look. <coughs> so here is a Nyquist frequency uh, the, the, of the 24 megapixel, and here is a Nyquist frequency of the 48 megapixel of the SL2. And this is the SL35 performance. So you see the SL35 has half Nyquist, uh, has 50% has contrast for 207 line pairs. It's enough for the next generations of sensors that will come. If they come or not, I don't know, but if they come, it's enough. 
So we always perform very well with these lenses <coughs> on a very high level. Let's go through these systems, the 90 millimeter ASPH <coughs> F2. As I explained, we have a double focusing group, 11, 11 elements and one, one A-sphere. And here's the performance. 40 line pairs, much more than 50%, it's at uh, nearly 90%. Yes. Not only at infinity, but also close focus. And this is also very important. And here is an example, what can you do? So here you see <coughs> the depth of focus is very shallow and crisp and sharp. I go through, I will show only three lens systems. The <coughs> So the, the contrast, the 50 millimeter is nearly the same setup, but more A-spheres. We have 12 lens elements and three A-sphere lenses. And again, performance is very, very high. I forgot to say for the first lens, magnification is always one by five. What does it mean, one by five? If you have a 35 millimeter format, it's 24 by 36 <coughs> yes, millimeters multiplied with five, you have a 180 by 120. So such object size you can image with each lens of it. 12 by 18 centimeter, yes. And here again, <coughs> wide open, three dimensional impression and you can go closer and you see more. And uh, I go back, I took this image with uh, one, one by 125 seconds, 2000 ISO, so <coughs> available light is possible with the camera. Yes. Again, close focus, very, very close. <coughs> and I'm fascinating with these images because Three-dimensionality is, is there, even in macro position, yes. The 35 millimeter, the best under the best. And the reason for that I will explain later. Here we have nearly 90% contrast on the highest level, not only at infinity, but also at close focus. And we all name the lenses apo. This means uh, the, the color correction is very well done. So that there's the focus position for, for three wavelengths need to be in the same, the same uh, shape. <clears throat> and the differences between not color ever uh, color corrected and color corrected, you will see intrafocal and extrafocal in, in, uh, in color rendition of the, of the highlights. And here you see the, the upper chromatic correction, there is no color rendition, there is no purple fringe or you name it. <coughs> And you see in defocus here, uh, here in extra focal is, is, uh, is greenish and here is reddish. And if you go, if you can, can uh, realize an apochromatic correction, you will not see it. And if you want to have such a high contrast, you need to apply apochromatic correction. It's very important. And now I, I do a comparison that is not fair but I explain why I'm doing this. Again, here are the frequencies, here's the contrast, and here's the SL35 millimeter lens. Here's a Nyquist frequency of the, uh, 24 megapixel and here 28. And if you compare with the 1.435M lens, this is the behavior on axis for this lens. And this is a very, very good lens in a very compact size, it's F number 1.4. But the 50% contrast is at 40 line pairs. And the 35 F2 is far away of that. <coughs> Who cares about MTF? Nobody. But, but the, the, the consequence for that is that the depth of focus impression of the F2 is quite similar to that what the F1.4 delivers <coughs> with one F2 with f1.4 because here is a contrast by through focusing indicated so here's the best position and if you go a little to defocus the contrast will drop very fast okay. 
And here you see the depth of field. If this, if you define the depth of field by how, how much contrast will fall off, it's quite the same. And that's the message. With this performance on a high level, F2 gives you the similar impression of depth of focus like an F1.4 with a lower contrast. And what does it mean? Here is some a practical proof, I would say. Yeah, the depth, the shallow depth of focus. Yeah. Even with F2, it's very shallow. If you go closer, yeah. <clears throat> So the, 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 the SL lenses are on such a high level that even F2 delivers impressions of F1.4. That's the reason why we said, okay, first we do F2 <coughs> before we continue to develop uh, faster lenses. <coughs> and if we have a look at the performance overall for, for the whole field, and where is the frequency with 50% contrast? Our lenses are prepared for 100 megapixel from on axis to off axis. This means you can, you can crop here or you can have a 100% look here in the edge with 100 megapixel sensor or whatever you use. And these lenses are prepared for such high resolution. This is my message. I will talk later about why do we need this <laughs> or can we can use it. But before I continue uh, with performance, I would like to talk about economic reliability or, or how can you how can we guarantee that that what we design we can, will deliver in, in practice or with our lenses. So highest optical performance is always tight tolerances. As high as the performance, as tight as the tolerances. And what is about the process stability? And so when we designed these lenses, we, we did a set, uh, we did a, um, new additional design targets, desensitization of the system, new methods for simulation. We used virtual prototypes and, and we implemented new production line, computer-aided, new measuring systems, lean production, scalable processes, and last but not least, we used the platform concept. Desensitization or reduction of sensitivity, what does it mean? When we look to look at the aposomicron M, it's the tolerances. Here are the groups indicated, <coughs> lens group one, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. And how much tilt shift is allowed for each para, uh, each group here? And you see here, the, group, the last group is very, very sensitive. Four microns are allowed. And we are able to, to produce this lens in a, in a good manner. But, but in this case, we had to do a, a different setup. Here are two lens elements moving within the system independently on a linear guide and we had to assure that, that the, the performance will keep even though there is a little tilt within the system and so we have had to find new designs and so we, we did the design and here again are the groups indicated and the tolerance much more we, we allowed much more tilt shift shift for each lens element without affecting the performance. And this is important to get a stable process within this uh, complex system because 12 lenses, 11 lenses are not <coughs> as good manageable for, the, for, the, for our colleagues in the, in the production, in the optical shop than, than this system here. And so, and why are we doing this? Because we have to assemble the system. It's packaged, it's full packed with, with electronic and electronic does not allow to disassemble and adjust and assemble again. We have to do it once and it need to be good on the, on, the, on the whole scale. And therefore we, we implemented a new production line and we implemented subgroup adjust, adjustment and check quality check. And each, each group I indicated here is equipped with a barcode. Not only the group as type, each lens element, each 
Each group has an own barcode, and so we know the performance of each group. We measure the group, and if, if it's, it's okay, you can, you can go to the next step. It's not okay, you can't use it further. And this is a very, very modern, modern, modern production. We have data matrix codes, we have digital, digital working instruction, and all data mining and all these things. And again, electronic is technology driver because we have to implement so much electronics. And this was a starting point for a platform concept because you need to, to implement the technology you use more than once. And so that's the reason why all lens systems are, have the same size. Internally, the mechanical design and the optical design has, follows the same concept. And this is a compromise for the SL system in comparison to M. And here I do the comparison. This is the SL system 75. It's not much bigger than the 75M aposomicron, but it's bigger. But what you see is here, as small as the focal length, as small as the lens is in M system. And we kept the size. And this is the reason why the 35 millimeter lens of the SL system is the best under the best, because we, we used, we could use more space than we need normally for, S, for a 35 millimeter lens. So as I said, on paper, we can do everything. In practice, we need to realize best performance for the customer so that you can be sure that you get best performance, not only in theory, but also in practice. And here is one, one, one uh, example. This is on axis performance. The frequency is here and the contrast. Red is the design. And these are the prototypes we produced. And there you can see very stable. Here is one, <coughs> one lens. This is a uh, full field MTF for 20 lampers, please. Okay. <clears throat> and here is Siri production. In this case, we focus on access. When we do the same, oops, oh, no, no, uh, I'm missing a, a, a slide. I, I <laughs> deleted it. If we focus on the face here off axis, this deviation would, would be reduced. This means the only variation of the of the MTF, the variation of the MTF is only based on, on curvature of field. There are no decentration errors or whatever. And so you will not see any failure in, in, in images, even, even in, uh, in, in bokeh or so, you will not see it. And so let's have a look at the perceived performance <laughs> now. Yes, for all these lenses here. And you see, I said image performance 100%. Oh, now you will say over-engineered, huh? Too much performance. Why, for what? I explained to you that the lenses are good for more than 100 megapixel, but for what? For this image? Of course, nobody, you can make such big pictures with, or uh, print out such pictures and go close and you will see more. But, but more, the concept behind is, is more oriented on that, what Barnack is saying, one shot, the moment of name, the, the, the snapshot is important. <clears throat> and two pictures in one image. So no zooming or changing the, the, the lens. Concentrate on the decisive moment. Image fine tuning comes later. Digital zoom without losses and more flexibility. And here are some examples I did by myself. This is one image uh, picture I took. And this is in, enlarged, second way enlarged. You can use the same, the same shot for different uh, purposes, as we can say. There's no need for zooming. Performance is there. Again, 50 millimeter, you can go closer and see more. <coughs> Concentrate on the decisive moment. And let's summarize in this case. We did a lot in design. Yes, 
multi-asphere optics, desensitization, lightweight construction, double focusing, two element electronic drives and platform. And we did a lot in manufacturing, in, in the manufacture here. This is a, the, the, the SL line we have in, in Wetzlar <coughs> with uh, active process control, virtual prototypes and subgroup testing and all these things. And we did this to get best performance. And now let's have a look at David and Goliath. They don't fight against each other, but David, highest performance in compact size, relative size is 1.7. This is only relevant if you compare with, with APS. <laughs> and, and this, this size is necessary to implement highest performance not compact but convenient and with most automatic function you can have and highest performance again and you need to decide what's more important for you the character of the m system the m, the m system will teach you to to get good images and you need to be willing to be teach by the m system like the phone pen teaches you to write or do you prefer more automatic functions, flexibility on a highest level. And that's the difference between M. M is M and stays M as long as it is. It, it, it's an mecha optomechanical system with high precision and long lasting and, 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 and compact. And the SL system is the most modern professional camera with the best lenses you can get. This is my message. Thank you very much for your, for your, for your uh, attention. Thank you very much for your patience. And thank you very much for staying so long. <laughs> Thanks a lot. A very nice, very nice final uh, message. Yeah. The decision is yours. Yeah. Um, Peter, uh, I would like to go on with, with some questions uh, that yes, we have in the session. So um, there has been some uh, earlier questions uh, which I didn't ask regarding the, the M system. So we go one step back to the M system. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the um, earliest question was from Patrick that is asking uh, why was the Noctilux designed for a minimal focusing distance of one meter instead of 0 0.7? Because of the, the focusing mount limits us. As closer as more uh, shift, focus shift, you have to realize. And this was uh, the limit we had to face. It's, it's always a balance between mechanical precision and haptics and, and weight and all these things. Yeah. So there was no other, other uh, option then? Exactly, yeah. The next question is from, uh, from David Theo. Um, he's asking that you've he heard that the Sumerit line and also the Elma 24 uh, will be discontinued. Uh, he's asking like if that is true and if yes, what is the, the reason uh, behind that we that we discontinue build the M line up like this and giving the customers less opportunities to choose from? Yeah, it's a pity, yes. <laughs> but uh, sales quantities, I think, are the reason. Okay. So for our, our customer, ex I, I, I personally, I, I think the Zoomerits are underrated, absolutely, the market, underrated. They have good performance in a reasonable price and, and to start with is, is the best set. For example, the 35 and the 75 as a combination with the, with the first camera, the Zoomerits are so, so well and compact. They are not cheap, but and they are not cheap uh, in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of design and uh, mechanics, but also underrated. When, some, when somebody is entering the, the M system, for example, is a, actually a good choice uh, to, to start with. Absolutely. I think, again, use it wide open and never stop down. And then you will see, how you, you need to learn how to use F2.4, yes? <laughs> And the next next question is from from Casey. So I think this was related to a specific slide. So Casey, if you are still there, uh, maybe you can explain 
what your question is referring to because I, I cannot see it here. Um, another question is, uh, what is a, a besides of the focal lengths, obviously, what is a, a basic difference between the 75 Noctilux and the, the 1.7, uh, the, sorry, the 90 millimeter Sumilux? And, wh and why makes, maybe why is the 90 millimeter not the Noctilux also? As I explained already, the entrance pupil of 60 millimeter was the limit. And that's the reason why we had to go to Sumilux because 90 millimeter divided by 1.5 is 60 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So the filter size is 67. And we can't enlarge the size of the lens without uh, vignetting the rangefinder area. So the functionality of the rangefinder wouldn't be possible with, with so larger lens. It's actually for, for using uh, uh, the rangefinder. Yes. Ah, okay, I understand. Uh, the next question is from Richard, um, who is asking about your personal opinion um, about what uh, can be can be called today the digital processing of, for example, uh, bouquet and other lens effects. I I have seen some examples from you where where you have used a Huawei phone with that uh, with that function where you have a, like a fake bouquet actually. So what do you think about that personally? And uh, by the way, would that be maybe on the same level as, as the natural bouquet in a couple of years? It will be harder to distinguish where the differences are because as, as better the process, uh, the, uh, the computer behind the, the, uh, the mobile phone, as better the performance of the, of the computer, <laughs> as better the, uh, they as clo closer they come to the to the real image, but <clears throat> there are still some some uh, how can I say artificial uh, effects you will see, and in some cases you will not realize it with uh, with uh, computer designed okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think I, I think for, for, for I, I appreciate this this functionality for mobile phone because then you can can uh, copy a little bit what we do with the system cameras yes but it's not the same absolutely not sure. I mean lucky for us would be if if that would be already on the same level. Um, Maybe a lot of people would, would not to choose to, to go for a camera and, and say like, if I have everything in my mobile phone, but I think oh, today it looks very artificial. So not very nice. Depends on the size, on the image size, yes. You use. If you have only a small, small image you look at, it can, be, can help to improve the, the, the impression and the look of the lens, uh, of, the, of the image, yes. The next question is from Stefan and he's asking about the 23 millimeter TL lens because yes. we, have, we have seen it uh, a shot. So he's asking, is that a good lens? And uh, he said, despite not being made in Germany, so. So yes, uh, it's a Leica lens, yes. And I have a presentation about the TL lenses also. And, and this is, I, I have a presentation about the M lenses, the TL lenses, and then the SL lenses. And so I, I put, today I put together both uh, M and SL. So and the TL yeah. lenses are on a high, very high performance. As I explained, we, we raised uh, the bars. And the, 20, uh, the 23 millimeter is, is derived from the 28 F2 M lens. Yes, has a high performance. Yes, it's made in Japan, but with our targets and our uh, test and acceptance conditions, and and we we did the approval for the prototype. We did the approval for the for the seal production, and we always do uh, checking whether <coughs> the production is on a, on the same level we expect all the time. Yes. 
I like this lens very much. <laughs> so then the next question would be um, regarding the first and second generation of the lenses that we have seen to the, uh, today. What is the maximum capacity of resolving? So what, what can they resolve in terms of megapixels? Could they resolve 60 megapixels or where is the limit on these first and second generation? Uh, the first and second generation wide open. We talk wide open. Yes, if you stop down to eleven, then then every every lens can perform on the, the up to diffraction limited. But wide open, I think today with uh, with twenty four megapixel, you see that the lens is is uh, is a limiting uh, factor, not the sensor. <laughs> so I I think between twelve and and twenty megapixel depends on the on the lens we're talking about and because obviously they have not been designed then for for a huge amount of of megapixels exactly but on the other side it's still it's still uh, funny or it's it's uh, what can i say it can be a good experience to use these lenses and the reason for that is on the one side you can can uh, can do pictures in the past they did. The, the positive message from my side is the production stability was done at that time too. And so you don't see artificial image uh, unsharpness or whatever due to decentration or so, yes. In that case, the lenses perform today is still good. <laughs> But but they have their own character. It's it's more soft focus. It's more not not driven to to resolve. It's yeah. It's more creamy. Perhaps it's better for portrait in some cases if you don't want to have too sharp portraits. Yes. Yeah, we, we recently got some some vintage lenses uh, for for our stores uh, because we are uh, doing like a vintage uh, campaign. And uh, we have done some test shots with, with those old lenses and I like them very much, the, the color uh, and also the, um, the bouquet itself was, was very nice, actually. Yeah, when, when I talk about performance, I always have a look at the technical mm -hmm. things, yes. What is possible? <clears throat> if you always have a special lens with, from my perspective, lower performance, but you can, can realize your pictures you want to do, there is no, no chance for me to argue that this is a bad lens. No, it fits to your expectation and it fits to that what we want to do. And this is always uh, the customer need to decide by himself. What do I want to express? How, which pictures do I expect and uh, to, to realize? And yes. <laughs> So let's go on with, uh, and we are almost done, a couple of questions. Uh, so especially here in Southeast Asia, the, um, the humidity, uh, humidity can, be, can be quite high. So do you have any uh, tips that you can give to prevent uh, fungus in the lens? No idea. Well, I'm not an expert in that, but, but we do, as I expressed already or explained already, uh, we do a lot uh, durability tests to to guarantee that our lenses are made to use in such humidity. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's one question from Adele uh, asking, uh, having said that uh, the SL lens are a totally new system, uh, what will be then the performance of the M lenses on the SL or SL2? camera so the aposomicron m lenses <coughs> uh, we have three as i yes they, they can perform quite well on the uh, 48 megapixel <coughs> there are some lenses as i showed already for example the 35 1.4 this is more appropriate wide open for the 24 megapixel uh, yes, uh, the the fifty percent contrast uh, corresponds to the <clears throat> to the twenty four megapixel. But if you stop down, you can in this case you can also use uh, 
the 28 megapixel yes if you want to use uh, the whole resolution of the sensor <coughs> perhaps in one some cases you need to stop down with the with the lens the next question is regarding um you, that we saw that uh, that uh, chart that you uh, showed us uh, with the with the different characteristics, and the question is, um, if we include more electronics in a lens, uh, does that mean it reduces the the robustness? So will it be more affected uh, against like issues if you have more electronics inside? Uh, long term, yes. It's like the mo uh, the auto uh, the car industry. Yes. So if you include more electronics and more, yes, we can't guarantee hard, twenty hard years for, for electronics. <laughs> okay, so let me check. Uh, next question is. Um, I try to be honest. Yes. No, <laughs> sure, I mean this is this is uh, why why the people like like to to hear because I mean this is I think what what we like a. Uh, should or most of us try to do that to to give a honest answer and honest opinion as we as we can um next question is regarding an aperture ring on the sl uh, lenses is there a specific reason that there's no aperture ring and will there be an aperture ring in the uh, future in sl lenses the the user interface phase we wanted to have an, a new concept and we thought uh, by the experience of that what we had with the APS system that we can get rid of the aperture ring yes but but for the future it's open <coughs> if the requirement is is there to use the aperture ring instead of the uh, the aperture setting by by camera we can do it but it's not on my side to decide Okay, the next question is from Eric. Um, if M generation three lenses can handle 47 megapixels, so let me answer that question. Um, Eric, there will be an upcoming event. It will be next Thursday. So um, please have a look on our um, Facebook page or Instagram or, or the homepage. I think they will find uh, further information. And I'm pretty sure that your question will be answered there, but we are not talking about this uh, today. So is there any... Um... Oh yeah, so the last question from, um, from Casey, he has explained that a little bit more. So uh, let, me, let me scroll up a little bit to find the question. So, um, He's asking uh, uh, on the on the theory of the opening of 60 millimeter. In that calculation, uh, would a 35 millimeter be actually an aperture uh, 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 0.75? Would be possible, you mean? In principle, yes. <laughs> With oh. entrance pupil calculation, yes. But we will not do. I don't think so. <laughs> So we are on the, on the on the initial topic here, like what is possible and what is uh, yeah. In, in principle, it would be possible, yes. When when you do the calculation, but unfortunately, it, it's whether the lens, uh, let's say different, with the tailored photo lens, the entrance pupil is very close to the first surface. When you have a wide angle lens, the entrance pupil it moves into the system, mm -hmm. and so. Even though the the entrance pupil is is uh, sixty millimeters, the first first lens need to be much bigger. So this calculation doesn't work for wide angle lenses. Of <laughs> okay, um, mm -mm. but quite interesting as question. Yes. <laughs> so okay, let me check on that and not not uh, miss any question. But if there are some questions we missed, we can answer by email if you can. Um, okay, maybe uh, this one is also nice. So uh, uh, from Patrick, he's asking like, he knows that Mandler's favorite uh, um, was the 75 Sumilux, 
So which is your favorite lens? <laughs> Somebody wrote in the internet that I'm not, uh, I don't like this lens 1.475. I never said that. I only said this is not my favorite because <laughs> uh, regarding Mantla 70, uh, 75 Somilux. Uh, my favorite lens, it's like asking the grandfather which, uh, which channel do you, do you like most? <laughs> But come on, there's always a favorite, I think. So, so from uh, M lens, I, I, my, my favorite is the 1.450 or the F2 Apo 50. And for the SL lenses at the moment, my favorite is the 35 <laughs> F2 mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's so high performance. It's, it's amazing. So uh, then next question from Danny. Uh, he's asking, what is your view of the uh, China designed and made Noctilux? You know about that? Yes, in principle, on design side, looks good. But the differences are, <coughs> how is the production? <laughs> yes. and, and all these things I explained to you already. Uh, I, I wonder how they can realize such lenses to, to such a small price. Who paid the price for that? I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> Who built this lens? Who worked for that? Labor, labor, maybe. <laughs> yeah, who? But who? <laughs> but you say in principle it's not a bad lens, then. Yeah. Designing is one thing. Yes. Putting the glass together, production of the lens elements, precision in the mounting, stable conditions durability test and all these things yes okay then we, we, we leave it like this uh, the next question from peter is uh, asking so in terms of performance would you say the sl lenses are the best or the s lenses are the the best in the leica uh, leica range because i mean we haven't talked about the s lens uh, um, yeah. today so i mean if you can give a short answer for that okay if not then Uh, then we leave it if it's not easy to explain. We raise the bar with the SL and these are the best lenses. Okay, clear, clear answer. Uh, um. Um. Okay, there's a question from Bell. Um, with the with this high level of engineering on the on the lens design. Uh, would the piece of filter we are using drop the quality of the of the image when you're using a filter? Uh, each lens, each additional lens element <coughs> introduces additional aberrations. A good filter, the aberrations you introduce are very small and you will not recognize. So. You need to be sure that you have a good filter <laughs> and that's it. Okay. Um, so, okay, another question. Uh, what, what's your opinion about the 35 Sumilux TL? TL? Yeah. Or should, should we leave the TL lenses? Uh, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I like to talk about TL. So my ch choice would be if I had to, to choose the 35 1.4 and the 60 2.8 as a starting point for the CL system. So the, the 35 1.4 is in comparison to that what the F2 Uh, 50 millimeter for the full frame delivers and it's compact fast delivers good bokeh unsharpness and sharpness so it's quite good lens <laughs> okay i then um okay one last question we have over here and i think then then we should uh, should be done so uh from chu chong is asking 
um, what is your wish list uh, on sensor technology? Um, more pixels or curve, or, or what? What do you think is the the next generation sensor able to do? Or what would be the requirements from your side for a for a new sensor? <laughs> Uh, the packaging in front of the sensor, but you are not involved in that. So, <laughs> as, as less surfaces between the lens and the sensor, <laughs> uh, optical surfaces. So, we have we have a filter packaging in front of the sensor, and if it would be possible, we should get rid of it. But that's not possible. But if you ask me, global shutter would be fine to have. Yes. Okay, but I mean you are sitting directly uh, right on, on and left to the to the people, so I think you can leave some comments in between. So this is one aspect we always have in mind or try to include in our development is a fil filter packaging in front of the sensor. Keep it as small as possible, and that's the reason why we could could survive with the M system because we always had to to uh, to, to be sure that this <coughs> that the, the concept of the M system could could survive and to survive we always need a very very thin filter packaging in front of the M sensor and this is always my wish as we can <laughs> we can keep the M system within the <laughs> production. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we are we are already very excited what what's up, upcoming in, in those what's kind coming of next yes yes right. it's fantastic <laughs> okay, really people, then, um, thank you thank you very much we will end the session here and uh, I really enjoyed it to to speak to you today or you speaking to us and um, I thank also to everybody uh, who has joined us today and stayed for us uh, with us for such a long time I mean we have uh, been doing yeah like actually two hours uh, this was our our longest sharing session today but the fact that you have stayed so long i think shows that uh, your interest was was very high there and on the peak we had more than 100 participants so uh, i think peter you can take that as a as a compliment because having 100 people at that uh, late time in the evening uh, i think uh, they were really interested and also i hope we answered every question as always, uh, the session will be recorded. So in, uh, in the case you have not understood maybe one or two things in the, in the presentation, then of course you can uh, rewatch it. And yeah, final words. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for the session um, and uh, the effort that you made to, to share all this information with us. And we hope to see you soon in, in person here in Singapore and Southeast Asia uh, to give another session and, and having you physically with us then. Thank you very much for your attention and good night for everybody. Good night. Good night. Stay, good night. stay, stay healthy. Yeah. Okay. And, and you continuing working right now while, while everybody of us is going to, to bed. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. And thanks to everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye.